Um, here. Fusion was one of the biggest promises of a virtually unlimited energy source. So the core of the sun produces 380 Yoda watts, so that's per second 380 Yoda joules, which we might have to look up what that really means. It's 3.8, 10 to the 26 watts, which is about like 10, 12 orders of magnitude higher than a human uh, consumption per hour. So that's a, a lot of energy actually that's coming out of the core, oops, coming out of the core of the sun as viewed by a, by a satellite in the VOV. So the very core is like a very hot gas, like a sea of ions and electrons that produce that fusion process. So it's essentially a merging of hydrogen isotopes into helium that produces the energy. So the big question that we have is can and how we establish this process on Earth and to put gigawatts of power into the grid as an energy source of the future. Fusion of hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium has the highest cross-section at the lowest plasma temperature, the lowest temperature we achieve. And so essentially, what you, it's a merging of um, heavy and super heavy hydrogen isotopes together, producing a neutron of a high energy and helium as of somewhat lower energy. So 80% of the product, of the reaction products, are in the neutrons, and these neutrons we want to use for energy production. So essentially, use them to heat water and drive turbines and produce energy. The remaining 20% is in the helium atom, which we call fast alpha particles, and we need those to self-heat the fusion process. There's a common approach to this, uh, to harvest this energy, and that's to confine and preheat the plasma until the process is self-sustained. And so there's a certain condition you have to apply to the plasma that can actually, that leads to this process to be self, to self-sustained and to be energetically ad advantageous. So there's a certain plasma temperature in excess of like 100 million Kelvin you have to achieve. You have to have a certain fuel density of one milligram per cubic meter that you want to have in one place. And you have to confine this fusion process for at least one second. And that's the burn condition that we have, which we usually refer to as a driven product. They are magnetically and inertially confined systems. And so I show an example here on the left-hand side of an, of an uh, of the magnetically confined system. So essentially we put a plasma into a magnetic vessel, in a vacuum vessel, and then we just uh, turn on the heat, and we confine this plasma with large magnets. And I have some feedback actually here too. Um, so this is the, basically the, the principle that we were going to use, and I would like to draw your attention that stars actually have the advantage that they're confined by their own gravity. So unfortunately we cannot harvest that kind of uh, process on Earth, so we're falling back on, on these other systems. The worldwide fusion research runs along three concepts, three major concepts. These are tokamaks, which I show over this timeline here, which jet being currently the largest machine in the world. Uh, Stellarators, which is the last helical device in Japan. And lasers, which is a national ignition facility in the US. And so running along the timeline, what we want to achieve within the next 40 years is a commercially available to, um, machine, a device that can produce that kind of energy, which is called demo, or the variants thereof. The next stepping stone, actually, for all of us, in terms of, and I will be focusing on the Tokamak line, it's the ETA Tokamak that is supposed to go online in the next uh, decade. Fusion performance has in Tokamaks, so the first line of research I showed before, has been pushed close to the break even, that is, that the output of the machine, of the plasma, is equal to the input of what we put in in terms of heating. So what I show on the left hand side is the fusion performance as a function of plasma temperature, which is kind of how we can preheat the machine. And I also run along the y-axis the years. So back in the 60s, we started with low temperature plasma with low performance, and as we went ahead, to the late 90s, we retrieved the conditions that are close to this break-even point, and the reactor condition is sitting on top of that. So we are actually currently sitting here with a cluster of high-performing pulses, which will obtain the machines with carbon-based walls. That is important. So generally speaking, at that point, we set the performance of the plasma to go beyond that to reactor condition. It's, it's uh, limited by plasma instabilities. Plasma doesn't survive and doesn't, cannot perform better. The power exhaust, that means that we heat up the wall too much and we have not retrieved it yet. And av available auxiliary power and other par machine parameters that are not available in this machine, like even like the largest tokamak currently. ETA will be, and I referred to that in the previous viewers, ITER will be the world's first burning plasma experiment to be operated in the 
the 2020s. So the machine, uh, like a CAT drawing, is shown on the, on the right-hand side. So essentially, it's, a, it's on the, based on the tokamak principle, and you see the plasma is sitting inside this machine structure. So compared to JET, ITER is about twice as large as a stronger magnetic field and a stronger plasma current, which is important for the confinement of the plasma. It has, it runs superconducting coils. So the running coils are superconducting, and so what happens, we have to put it into a cryostat system, so everything around here has to be super cooled down to a liquid helium to keep the coils um, um, critical. The input power is not much larger, but if you look at the output power, it's like really where we just have much more power coming out than putting, putting in, and so that's what we want to achieve. And just to show you that ITER is not just a CAT drawing, ITER is currently being built in Cadarache, that's in southern France, on the uh, French nuclear site. And so you can see that picture is about like six months old. You can see the uh, basically construction site, the headquarter of ITER, and the tokamak hall that will actually host the, uh, the machine. And the, it's part of the French um, nuclear um, authority. So, so far, I have been actually saying that we describe the principle how fusion will work. And I have been saying that there are various timelines that we want to achieve in the long run. There have been some serious drawbacks, actually, and, and a difficulties we encountered through the years, in particular in the late 90s when we hit the highest performance in these, these machines, as I said, they were run in carbon walls. So JET, the largest tokamak in the world, was running a deuterium tritium campaign to come very close to the conditions that we want to achieve in, in future machines in the late 90s. But it revealed the significant buildup of tritium in the vessel in carbon layers. So I want to remind you the highest fusion uh, uh, output has been achieved in the tritium and tritium, the right mixture, and so we have to fall back on tritium to actually make it. But the tritium is, the site limit is set by nuclear regulators, which has very little to do actually with plasma physics or materials. So we are bound to this condition, and so what we did in the late 90s is we measured the tritium in inventory as a function of the pulses we run throughout the, the, the tritium tritium campaign. And so you can see that we put more and more tritium in, that's a cumulative input, as we reached like 35 grams of tritium at the end of the campaign. But at the same time, we also measured how much stayed in the machine. And so basically, you can see that by the end of the campaign, where we didn't put any more tritium, 17% stayed inside, even following extensive cleanup of the machine. If you take now these results from the tokamak and extrapolate what will happen in future machine, the buildup of such amounts of tritium extrapolates to less than 300 hours in ITER, which will be completely unaccepted in future machines. So what we, we took the results and we, again, we took the measure, we extrapolated the tritium inventory as a function of time or as a number of shots that you discharge you can do in ITER. And we, we extrapolated and we came up with a number of like 350 ITER pulses of 400 seconds or in other words, like 300 hours. Until we reach, if the machine is built on, based on carbon, we reach that number in a much shorter time. So unless effective cleanup techniques is demonstrated now, carbon is deemed to be unsuitable as a plasma, plasma phasing component, ITER, let alone for future machines. So we hit that serious obstacle. Luckily, at the same time, the London line of research actually was looking into metals and surrounding the plasma of metals. And so we saw, oops, we saw that, the, that we have 10 times less tritium built up in metal machines, such as tungsten. So the question remaining then was, can sufficient plasma performance be achieved in these machines? So as I show here on the left-hand side, just to vindicate this point that we have the Again, our, our plot from the carbon, and we fall back on, on, on metals that actually allow very long periods of, of uh, times to be run, which would be acceptable in future machines. These results have actually been, been shown to be validated in an existing, result, in an existing machine as a jet running now for barium and tungsten wall. So tungsten, what's the problem with tungsten? Tungsten is a very strong radiant in the core plasma, so it, but it leads to a very, very strong reduction in the temperature, which can quench a fusion process. So that's what we don't want. And so currently, we turned most of our experiments into test facilities for materials to actually achieve high uh, performance in metal machines. And the big the example that I brought up already is a jet uh, ether-like wall which is made of beryllium and tungsten since 2011. And so we're currently working on this uh, concept to see to recover the performance. So the fusion challenge is determined by both plasma physics and material science. So the plasma physics on the left-hand side is related to the energy leakage, so the confinement out of the core that we want to control. It's a confinement of the fast particles, these alpha particles that we need for self-heating, and also plasma wall interaction. 
On the material end, we're looking for materials that are re erosion and melting resistant, so they can actually be used on these machines, and also materials with low tritium retention. And all five areas are focus of the fusion program at Art University in collaboration with the national lab, that's the VTT, and all international partners. So to bring up a couple of examples on you know, how we work actually and how we feed into this uh, worldwide program is given the next few graphs. So as I said, the energy flow from the center, so that's a that's the center of the plasma, that's a, that's a vertical cut of the plasma, so it's like a torus, like a donut going around. So from the center, the energy flow from the center to the edge of the plasma is not just a steady state outflow of energy, but it's more like a large scale flows and turbulence that's indicated here by, by fluctuations in, in the density. Um, in order to actually have an accurate prediction of the energy confinement, we require a fully kinetic approach to, to capture all the transfer processes over a wide range of uh, time scales. And so for that purpose, the MCOFIRE code was developed in collaboration with VTT and, and us that actually gives an, that gives an kind of a prediction how fast this process is taking place and what are these processes that we need to now take care of. And so as an example here, I show the fluctuating density. So what you see in red are the density being above the mean and blue below the mean, and you can already see that this is not a very symmetric problem. You can see that some certain region of the plasma are more affected than the others, and that, that towards the edge, this energy flow is actually increasing, which is not what you really want. So we, we want to understand these processes, and the ultimate goal is actually to manipulate the energy flow from the core to the edge. Secondly, a significant power loads to the walls are predicted by the iron orbit code ASCOT due to these fusion born alphas I said in the beginning. We need these particles. They're, they heat our plasma, they're self-heated, and they keep the fusion uh, going. And so ASCOT is a code that has, uh, again, been developed between the VTT and the ALTO group. And so what the, actually the prediction showed, this is a view of the tokamak, and this is the view, it's a projection of the heat flux onto the surrounding walls. And so what you see basically here is that there are certain areas that are turning red. And these areas that are turning red means that there's a lot of heat going to these areas, which means that some of these areas, some of these heat flux, if we cannot control the material, would not take it. And so this has been identified as a problem, as an issue for running these larger machines, such as ITER. So these are fully predictive, um, um, these are predictions. And so as a part of the, the collaboration with, um, with, the, with ITER, we then came up with like a concept um, to, um, to mitigate the optimal magnetic field by installing like certain metals around the machine that can actually turn these red areas into yellow or, or, or orange areas, which take the heat, the peak heat fluxes down to a level that we can control them. So it's a very important point. And last but not least, excessive heat fluxes to the wall lead to overheating and melting of plasma fusion components. That's very, very obvious. And so what you see here on the left-hand side is the, it's an infrared image of the jet tokamak during operation. So these are taken during the plasma discharge for several seconds. And these surface areas, they heat up. So red is bad and green is good. We are concerned, even though the area is small, in the bottom of the machine where we have to deal with these heat fluxes. And that's the main region where we exhaust the power and exhaust the particles. And so taking the, the heat fluxes now to these uh, surfaces and plotting them against a parameter that we can vary in the machine rather easily, and that's our main experimental knob, that is the core density, so the density, how many particles you put in the machine. You can see experimentally that if you increase the density, if you make the plasma more dense, you can actually reduce the heat fluxes to a level that you can tolerate them. However, we also try to simulate these um, heat fluxes, which are like important to predict to next step machines. And so for certain conditions, so low, low density region, we can actually come very close to predicting what, what is going to happen. But we are far away from the experimental data at the high density uh, end where we really want to have very solid simulations. So there's a certain need of improved prediction of power to the walls, and that's part of our contributions to, to the worldwide program It's coming out of the art um, collaborations. So in conclusion, I hope I showed you that taming a star on Earth is a challenging task. 
This is not a very straightforward thing as we were hoping, and we cannot just take the sun and put them on, on Earth. The concepts are different. Fusion research has been pushed to the limits, and the challenge is determined both by plasma physics on the one end and material science on the other, and that makes it an interdisciplinary problem. The best performing plasmas were obtained in tokamaks, these donut-shaped uh, machines, in carbon-based walls, but unfortunately, they led to an unacceptable bit of tritium in the machine, and we have not actually been able to circumvent that problem. There has been then, because following of that work in the late 90s, a shift of emphasis from, from one material, that is carbon, to metals like converting the largest tokamak jet into an ether like wall component with beryllium and tungsten, these are metals, and they actually led to a reduction of tritium, so we can actually have found a material now that can, can be used in future machines. However, what we're working on currently, as we're speaking, was that we can actually recover the performance. The community needs a next step device, ITER, that is ITER, to demonstrate the feasibility of fusion for future energy production in a demo class reactor. So we take a step, intermediate step, that is ITER, and trying to build, based on that one, the next machine. Alte University, the, the fusion group, has a long tradition in making significant contributions to the field. I've shown you several examples how this actually is working and has been. So our goal, and I think with the appointment of this professorship, is to train the next generation scientists for ITER and then take it even beyond. So these, this, our students will be scientists, will be uh, tokamak operators. They will be involved in this um, very challenging task until we actually have a demo class reactor that can be used in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.